Um, I want to talk first about my first project that I worked on when I joined ThoughtWorks, which was in uh, 2005. I was working at a large ISP, um, and we were developing a new broadband provisioning system. And we had a couple of teams of people. It was a medium-sized project, about 60 people. And we were deploying this new system to a Solaris cluster, but we were developing on Windows machines. And we were using Java, so Java is cross-platform, right? So there's no problem if you deploy in Solaris and develop on Windows, OK? <laughs> How could that go wrong? Um, uh, and we, we, we knew there would be a problem, so we wanted to test it. But we were working in a large organization. It took six months to get production like Solaris boxes that we could test on because they, had to, they couldn't just buy them. That would be too easy. They had to ship them from America via Luxembourg to London. Um, and by the time they'd done that, uh, the system was quite well developed. And the first time we tried to deploy that system to a Solaris cluster, it took us two weeks. And when we finished deploying it, the system didn't work. <laughs> of course. Um, and so we formed a team whose job it was to deploy the software. So that's already an anti-pattern, right? Uh, and I was part of that team. That was my first job at ThoughtWorks. Uh, and most of what's in the book is <laughs> what I learned on that job, uh, actually. So the fact it took two weeks to deploy was problematic. Firstly, because it meant there was a long feedback cycle between developers writing code and then getting feedback from testers on whether that code actually worked. Second, it was a problem because we wanted to deploy this to production to release this software, and we didn't want it to take us two weeks. Um, so we got together with the operations people and we found a technology they were comfortable with, which was Bash, and we designed a system to deploy the software into their environment. Uh, it was a series of Bash scripts and we called it Conan the Deployer. Um, and the idea was you could run Conan and you could type in the name of the environment and the CVS tag and it would build the system and deploy it to the environment. And we got the deployment time down from two weeks to about one hour by automating this deployment process. And that was great for the software delivery process because it meant people could get fast feedback on whether the software worked. But it also meant that when we came to deploy it, um, it, it was a much easier process. There was, a, there was a separate consultancy whose job it was to manage the release. And they ran around in polyester suits and created Gantt charts. Um, and there was a big Gantt chart with the release process. And, and the actual deployment of the new software was actually quite a small part of that release process. Most of it was decommissioning the old system and moving, uh, changing network settings. And we had to call the database administrator. We were doing it in the middle of the night in London. And we had to call the database administrator in Texas to get them to run some scripts as part of the upgrade, uh, as part of the new deployment. So that wasn't very automated. Um, and the great thing was it, it basically worked. The first time we ran the script to deploy into production, it didn't work. And we found out very quickly, fortunately, it was because there was a different shell installed in production. In production, they were using shell, and we were using bash, and shell can't fork new processes. So the deployment script would log in, it would try and fork a new process, that wouldn't work, bang. So we fixed that, and then it was a fully automated process, and it worked. And what that meant was that we could keep deploying new versions of the system. And because the operations people understood the software to deploy the system, and they could run it themselves, they felt confident in their ability to deploy the software and, 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 and change the deployment system. And so they were deploying every, uh, you know, multiple times uh, a month, which in 2005 was quite a big deal for an enterprise system in a large organization. Um, and they were deploying in the middle of the day and so forth. So that was a great result for us um, and, and for them, uh, all of us together. But it demonstrates a problem that is very common with agile adoption, which is that you can start off, you know, people say, we're going to go agile. Woo, we're going to go agile. And uh, what that normally means is not that the whole organization is going to go agile, but that the developers are going to go agile, right? So you start doing agile development in these nice iterations, uh, but nothing ever goes out to users. Uh, you know, uh, 
and then you finish the software, which might be several months, and then you throw it over the wall to the testing people, and they test it. And if you see the project Gantt charts, there's a testing phase, and there's never a phase to fix the bugs that were found, which I always found mysterious. So anyway, they, they get logged. That's the important thing, right? Um, and then, you know, maybe you fix some really important bugs, and then you throw it over the wall to operations, and they have to release it. Often, they have never seen this system before the week that it is to be released, right? And, and they, you know, what's this horrible software? It's, you know, we don't know how to monitor it. We don't know how to do logging. We know, we've got no idea how to redeploy it or how to fix the problems that are found. And then, you know, the developers then disappear, poof, and go and work on other projects, and no one knows how to maintain that system in production. So this is very common, and it's very bad. Uh, and there's basically no point in doing this, more or less. Uh, and this is the main reason why people complain that Agile doesn't work. Well, yes, it doesn't work if you do this. So continuous delivery is really about trying to change that. And there is a better way to do things. Um, is John Allspore here? Yay, hi. Um, so John Allspore works for an organization called Flickr. Did, who went to John Allspore's talk before this? Okay, so a few of you. Um, if you go to code.flickr.com and you scroll down to the bottom, you get this nice graph which is automatically generated. And if you do the math, you can see they're deploying multiple times a day. And the important thing to note is that this is only possible with discipline. People, thought, people often complain about Agile being about cowboy development. Oh, the developers can do what they want, and we don't need requirements and documentation, you know, and, and it got a bad reputation. Because, but that's not really agile. If you're not able to create documentation automatically, if you're not able to create scalable architectures, you're not really doing agile. It requires discipline. That's the key differentiator. And it's the same with this. Um, when Yahoo acquired Flickr, um, someone in Yahoo basically said, leave these guys alone, let them do what they want. Um, and people started finding out about this and they got really scared. And so one of the things that John did was he looked at the uptime of Flickr and the uptime of Yahoo, and he found that Yah uh, Flickr had much better uptime than Yahoo. It was more stable, it was less likely to go down, they fixed things quicker when it did go down. And it's because they used a lot of discipline to make sure that this actually worked. So, um, I'm going to you know, proceed actually by talking about why you would do this. I, 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 was, I was inspired by this morning's talk, prior to this morning's talk, so that was good. Um, the first reason is to get feedback. And feedback is crucially important because every business works like this. You have a hypothesis that someone will pay you money for something. And then you execute it by producing a product. And then you release that product and people either give you money or they don't. Often they don't. Uh, and most hypotheses are wrong. And that's normal. That's fine. The crucial thing is to get that feedback as soon as possible. So there's an idea of creating a minimum viable product, the smallest possible thing that you think people will pay for, and get it out to market, get feedback as soon as possible on uh, whether people actually will pay money and, and start getting metrics rapidly. Um, there's a guy called Eric Rees um, who uh, has a blog called Startup Lessons Learned. He's producing a book in September called The Lean Startup who has developed a whole methodology around managing startups which discusses this. And this is the crucial point. You want to make this cycle of developing customers and, and, and pushing software out the door as, as tight as possible so that you can iter pivot, uh, get feedback on whether your idea is actually any good. The second reason to um, release frequently is that counterintuitively, it reduces the risk of releases. And again, I've stolen this nice picture from John. Um, if you release every three months and something goes wrong, the natural reaction is to say, well, let, let's release less often. That's, that was clearly a bad thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. You should release more frequently when that happens because that is how you will fix those problems and create a reliable release process. If you release smaller batches, then there is less stuff to diagnose when something goes wrong. You can say, oh, it was these four lines of code that changed. It was this Apache config setting. 
it was this route assessing because you can see at a glance exactly what changed. If you've got six months of changes or even a month of changes, actually working out what the root cause of the problem was is much, much harder. And people have forgotten what they were working on a month ago. I can barely remember what I was working on a week ago. I don't know about you guys, but you know, certainly most developers have very uh, powerful amnesia uh, in my experience. Uh, so that this, this is a way of, of, of playing to that natural human behavior. Um, the third reason to release frequently is that it's the only true measure of the progress of your project. Now, project managers have developed these extremely sophisticated methodologies for guessing when something might actually happen. Uh, and the problem with guesses is that they're wrong. Uh, and again, there's all kinds of statistical analysis to work out how wrong you might be, but it's kind of like quantum mechanics. You know, It's going to be somewhere on that graph, and we think probably it'll be here, but guess what? It actually ended up being here. Um, the only real measure of whether you're done with something is it being released in production. What I sh that picture I showed earlier of, of you know, development, testing, operations, most of the pain and most of the variability comes between dev complete and live. That's where most of the variability in the process is when you're working on you know, three month, six month release cycles. And so being dev complete, how, how many times have you heard developers say, oh, we're done? And you're like, are you done or are you done done? You know, it's like you're only done done when it's released. Uh, uh, and so any other measure is basically just, you know, very advanced guessing, you know, which is, you know, project management is advanced guessing, more or less. Um, when I was writing the book, I tried to come up with a name for, for the book. I'm very bad at naming things. Um, and I was reading the Agile Manifesto, and it's the 10th anniversary this year of the Agile Manifesto. And everyone knows the, the, the front bit, this over that, people over process, so forth. But there's also principles. And the first principle is this. And Martin Fowler actually didn't want to include this. He said, this is obvious. Everyone knows this. There's no point putting this in. And the other people who were writing the manifesto kind of you know, steamrolled it over him and forced him to include it. And I think it's very important. It's very easy to forget this, that this is really what we're trying to do as, as engineers. Um, satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And it's the valuable that's important. That's where the hypothesis meets the users. That's how you determine value, uh, not as part of the engineering process. So you want to... The engineering process should not be the constraint. How do we do this? And crucially, you want to evaluate the effect of every change, whether that's code, infrastructure, configuration, data migration, so forth, uh, and give that feedback to everyone, everyone, as soon as possible, including operations people, database administrators, the business. And then you get to this situation. Um, and the idea is that there's a constant flow of stuff into production. And that changes the way you deliver software. And it also changes the way that you develop your, your, you know, your, your business. Um, and the crucial effect of continuous deployment <coughs> is, is this. Software is always production ready. There's never a point where you couldn't go in and deploy the latest version of the software. If you're doing continuous delivery, even if you're not always deploying, because you don't necessarily always need to deploy, if you're working on a product like I am, we don't release to users uh, all the time. We only release every three months. But we could release at any time. We could walk into a room and say, I want to deploy the latest build because there's a critical bug fix that we need to give our customers. And we could just release that at any time. The software is always ready to be released. And what that means, in turn, is that your releases are tied to what the business wants, not what your engineering team is able to do. The engineering team no longer becomes a constraint. And that makes an enormous difference to every business, because the spotlight is then on the business and the ideas the business have. What should we do next? When that's your problem, that's a great problem to have. Uh, and that's what we're aiming for. So how do we do this? Um, there's three key elements, configuration management, continuous integration, and automated testing. Configuration management um, basically means everything that I need to be able to create my production system from nothing should be in source control. 
I should be able to sit down at a new workstation, check out from source control, run a single command to build my system, run another single command to deploy it to any environment I have access to. I should be able to take a new computer, plug it into my rack in my server farm, plug in the network, plug in the power, and have that box be brought up into the correct state to join the production cluster in a fully automated way. That's the level of configuration management we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about continuous integration and automated testing in, in more detail. Um, the only thing that's tricky with configuration management is databases, and I'm going to leave that till last, and hopefully I don't run out of time. Um, so continuous integration. Um, who here is doing continuous integration? Anyone? Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep them up. Put your hands down if you don't commit to trunk at least once a day. Okay, put your hands down if you use feature branches. If you keep branches that aren't checked into trunk at least once a day. Uh, put your hands down if you... Actually, that's fine. So there's about half of you, less than half of you left. So continuous integration does not mean installing Jenkins or Hudson and running it on your branches. Continuous integration means everyone checks into version control on mainline at least once a day. So this is the pattern. Um, you develop some stuff, you build it, it passes. Woo, you're awesome. Uh, you then need to make sure that no one's made any conflicting changes. So you pull from your mainline server, you build again, and everything works. Still awesome. Uh, then you push changes back to mainline, and your continuous integration server builds, and uh, you go and have a cup of coffee because just to reward your awesomeness. Uh, so that's the basic cycle, and you should be doing that multiple times a day, assuming you're not working on open source. Open source is different. Um, but the same principles apply. And the idea is if you're working on uh, a proper system, you know, an enterprise system, whoops, everyone commits to the main line at least once a day. Otherwise, you're not doing continuous integration. It's impossible to be doing feature branches and continuous integration. They are mutually exclusive. That's a controversial statement, which I won't defend now because I don't have time, but feel free to bother me afterwards. Martin Fowler wrote a good blog entry about this. Um, so if you look on Martin Fowler's Blicky, you'll see something about feature branches and continuous integration. So I'm going to talk about testing now. W. Edwards Deming was one of the founders of the Lean movement, um, and he had this great quote, which I love. Testing is not a phase. Quality is not the responsibility of the testers. Quality is the responsibility of everyone. And testing should be done all the time. What kinds of testing? Firstly, there's unit tests, which are tests that developers write. This is a, uh, a quadrant diagram by Brian Marrick. Um, he's a smart, he was one of the founders of the Agile Manifesto, and he, uh, he divides tests up into business facing and technology facing, tests that support programming and critique the project. So this is a very useful way to analyze tests. There's tests down here that developers write uh, as part of test driven development. Uh, you write the test first, and then you make the test pass, then you check in, then you refactor, then you check in, then you write another test, and you make the test pass, then you check in, then you refactor, then you check in, and you do this multiple times a day. Uh, so the unit tests are the tests that you write when you do that. But unit tests validate that they're used to design the system at the micro level. They don't validate the behavior of the system at the macro level. So you need acceptance tests to prove that users are getting the value that they expect. If you change some component of your system, say you change your database technology, that will, um, that will change the unit tests. And so you'll have no way of validating the system still works. The acceptance tests validate that the users get what they want. And you have to do that as well. And again, these should be automated. Um, there's frameworks for doing this, like Selenium, WebDriver, so forth. There's rich client technologies for this. If you're using Silverlight, Sorry, you're kind of out of luck, but any other technology, you're pretty much okay, unless it's something really obscure. Um, it's also important to test 
for performance and availability and scalability right from the beginning of the project. And this is not an absolute measure, it's a relative measure. You want to see if a check-in affects the performance. If, if someone checks in some code and it makes the performance radically slower, you want to know as soon as possible. And this is important because it's the architectural decisions that you make that decide the non-functional um, behavior of the system. So you want to test that early on when the architecture is cheap to fix. People only do this at the end, and then they need to make large architectural changes, and those are very expensive. So you need to do this from early on to validate for architecture. And then finally, there's some things that can't be automated. Showcases, exploratory testing, usability testing, and those are the things that you need people for. Those are the things that require imagination and innovation, and those are the things that your testers should be doing. If testers are manually doing regression testing, it's a waste. Um, my colleague Neil Ford tells a joke that when people do things that machines could be doing, the machines get together late at night and they laugh at us. Uh, testers should not be doing regression testing. So I'm going to talk a bit about the next stage, which is the deployment pipeline, which is the key pattern in continuous delivery, which is an automated, well, it's this. You take your process for releasing software and you model it. Uh, and you automate it, and you give control to people to self-service what they need. Um, and it gives you three key things. Firstly, visibility into the production readiness of your system. Secondly, feedback, did my change affect the system? Uh, and if so, what was the effect? And thirdly, control, you're giving people control over what they do. Uh, testers can self-service deployments to testing environments. Operations people can self-service deployments to production um, and staging and so forth. And the idea is you take the CI loop, check in, when there's a check in, you build your system, the unit tests fail, people get feedback, they fix it, they check in, and you extend it all the way out to production. This is a very simple example of a very small linear system. Your system may spread out and be more complex if you're doing anything, you know, anything non trivial. So the idea is that when your unit tests pass, that should trigger your automated acceptance test, and that will be a bit longer, and people can still be checking in and doing stuff here. When that passes, then a build, that build becomes available for deployment to, say, user acceptance testing environments, or performance testing environments, or security testing environments. And then when people have signed off on that build, again, the system records it, and it tells the operations people there's a new build that you could deploy. And if the operations people in the business want to deploy that build, they can press a button and it will deploy it. So your whole value stream from check-in to release becomes uh, visible and those operations become self-service. And you can do this incrementally. Some of these things are manual. But the crucial thing is the people performing manual processes can self-service any build they want. And then they can tell the system this build is good to, to deploy or not. And then everyone can see that. As builds move through this environment, you have more confidence in them. It's like in, in Greek mythology, there's a, there's a hero who has to pass lots of tests before they get to marry the beautiful woman. Uh, you know, every check-in leads to a build, and the build has to pass a series of tests to prove that it can be released into production. So as builds move through this, and every check-in creates a build, creates a release candidate that goes through this process, um, you have more confidence in its production readiness as it goes this way but you get faster feedback this way. If we had infinite computing resources, this would be, you know, doing all this automated testing and manual testing would, would, would be instantaneous. But, you know, often all acceptance tests can take hours sometimes, so you want to parallelize that as much as possible and make sure that you're getting feedback on your unit tests at least within 10 minutes. And it looks something like this. You can build a deployment pipeline with open source software. I work for a product company which produces a tool called Go. It looks like this. Um, it's more elegant and beautiful and, and awesome than the open source stuff. But that, that's my sales pitch. Um, the crucial thing when you're starting with, um, with continuous delivery is this. Uh, and measuring this is the first step. A lot of organizations can't even measure this number. That number is called cycle time, and everyone should know it. It's actually a proxy measure. The real measure that you want to know is um, how long it would take if you wanted to delay uh, 
putting a feature into production. Uh, there's a great book called Product Development Flow by uh, Dan Reinertsen, which talks about this. But this is a very good proxy metric. I mean, really, you want to be measuring business metrics, but this is a good proxy metric. Uh, and you're not allowed to log into production and edit things with VI. That's cheating. Okay? You have to actually use your normal process. Uh, and the important thing is, if this is sufficiently short, you can use your normal process as your emergency process. And that's where continuous deployment is super valuable because it's so easy in an emergency to make a mistake. You want to validate every change in an emergency situation through your normal process to give you confidence. Um, I mean, at ThoughtWorks, we have a massive rack of computers to run automated tests in parallel. Those would take 36 hours end to end. We run them in 45 minutes in parallel. And at MVU, who invented continuous deployment, they have an even bigger amount of hardware um, that they throw at the problem of running the automated test so they can get feedback in 20 minutes. So their cycle time is incredibly short, even though they're running enormous numbers of tests against every change. So I'm going to talk a bit about reducing the risk of release, which is the main point of continuous, well, one of the three main points of continuous deployment. How do you do this? Firstly, you need to automate provisioning and deployment. And the, that cycle time metric I showed you, there's another metric which is very important, which is time to provision. If I plug a computer into a rack and I plug in network and power, how long does it take before it can join the production cluster? And that's important in the event of, um, of failures, especially like really bad failures. You want to have a predictable number as to how long it will take you to re restore service given a catastrophic failure. And this whole thing about infrastructure as code and automation provisioning allows you to do that. And that is, that's nirvana for operations people. If there's a predictable time to recover, you know, if I can, especially if you have a, a, you know, multi-site systems or a cloud system, the ability to say, okay, if this goes down, I know I can get, I can start from nothing and have a restored service in X amount of time. That's what the automation of the provisioning process gives you. The second way of re reducing the risk of release is to make sure everyone collaborates, and this is where DevOps kind of comes in. These are two of the more important things in DevOps. Um, I was at a large retailer uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they were working out how to make their release process faster and more reliable. And they got everyone from all the different silos, from development and operations and infrastructure, in, not everyone, but representatives in one room, and there was about 16 people. Uh, and we talked about continuous delivery and we had a maturity model and it was great and, and the, the funny thing was even though it's you know not a new company and quite a large company they said this is the first time that all those representatives from all those silos had been in a room together and that was the success the success was that at the end of it everyone understood everyone else's problems just the exercise of having everyone talk through how we make the release process better involves everyone and getting everyone to have a shared understanding of what the problems are and how to solve them was actually, for me, the main benefit of, the, of that, uh, uh, that gig. So I'm going to talk about some more technical things uh, briefly. Firstly, canary releasing. So canary releasing is a great way to reduce the risk of uh, deploying new versions of your software. And the idea is you have a bunch of users of your cluster and then what you do when you deploy a new version is you, you peel off a few boxes and, route a few use and, and deploy the new version of your system to those boxes and route a few users to those boxes. And you, you, you look and you see, did anything change? What are the metrics? Um, are we, uh, and companies like Netflix actually measure the revenue delta. They see, does this new version make us more money or less money? And they roll back if it makes less money. It's a great way to test whether your new feature is actually valuable or not. Uh, and again, because they have a short cycle time, they can say, oh, what if we did this? They develop it, push it out, they test it. Revenue, higher or lower? Okay, do we roll back or do we proceed? Uh, and then when that's good, you then route all the users to the new version. If something's bad, it's very easy to remediate. You just change the load balancer config to point everyone back at this version. Uh, you can also do more complex things like having multiple versions in production. That's better to do at the application stack level. Um, Facebook have a really nice video about their release process um, uh, and they talk about how they manage features, which I'll come to in a, in a bit. Uh, so you can reduce the risk of release, you can do multivariant testing, you can do performance testing, which is expensive to do um, if you don't have, uh, if, if your production system is a massive cluster. 
So I'm going to talk about incrementalism at the release level. Incrementalism is at the core of continuous delivery. Incrementalism in development, in deployment, in changing your organization. You don't want to do big bang, let's stop and do continuous delivery. You want to implement it incrementally. So how do you put out new features? Well, you don't just launch them, especially on a system like Facebook. When Facebook launched their chat, they didn't just put it out there and switch it on. They first developed it at the back end, and Facebook has a PHP front end and an Erlang back end for their chat system. They, they, they switched it on, but they didn't make it visible to users. So when people logged on to Facebook, it, 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 would, it would send a message to the chat system, and people would be able to, you know, the chat system would see people coming online and they had some JavaScript which injected messages into the chat system for testing purposes, but no one could actually see it. And only when they were ready to switch it on did they uh, make a configuration setting in prod and then suddenly that became visible to users. Facebook say that every feature that will be launched in the next six months is already in production. It's just not visible to users yet. And that's a great way to manage the risk of releasing. Uh, uh, and they, they manage what's visible through uh, feature toggles or feature bits, and John Allsport talks about this in, in his talk. And the idea is simply that you, you configure which features are available, and then you, you can either just use if statements in PHP. You can also use this technique for managing changes further down in your stack. So like, you know, what, what database persistence technology you use. Um, you can incrementally change things further down the stack and, and switch which implementation gets used, basically using polymorphism, right? It's just object-oriented programming. Uh, I'm going to touch briefly on monitoring. Monitoring is essential because it's the feedback loop, the ultimate feedback loop, uh, not only on what you're delivering, but on your process. And the most important bit of monitoring is actually monitoring business metrics, knowing the delta in revenue, knowing the number of orders you're taking, knowing the number of users you have. Those will change as you push out new versions of your software. And everyone, developers, the business, should have screens with graphs which show this stuff so they can see the effects of what they're doing. If you decouple people from the effects of what they're doing, they will become bored and they will not care. And that's the biggest problem that we have in trying to enable people to do their jobs better is giving them feedback so they can actually care about what they do. Secondly, you need to measure operations metrics, things like time to detect, time to restore service, time between failures. Uh, and crucially, you need to do root cause analysis and correlation. When things go wrong, you need to find out why and learn and feed that back into your process. Uh, and you need to correlate incidents with um, the, the, the things that cause them so you can prevent them happening again. Um, and then finally, you also want to measure technical metrics. Um, what if someone replaced your buy button with spacer.gif? Your automated test wouldn't catch that. So what they do at MVU uh, and other organizations is they have an immune system. They actually detect if the business metrics have changed as part of their canary release. If they release to 50% of the servers and the revenue goes down by 50%, it automatically reverts. That's a great way of protecting your, your system against uh, bad, uh, against problems that the automated test didn't find. Although then you need to then write an automated test to protect you against that in the future. Um, data migration, uh, I haven't got a lot of time on this. There is no silver bullet. Data is your biggest problem. Data will outlive your systems. It's huge, it's hard to migrate. There are techniques for dealing with it. Um, one, the most important thing is to script your database changes. It should be possible to recreate your schema from scratch using version control. And when you push out a new release, it should be possible to migrate your database to the new version of the schema in a fully automated way. Uh, that should be part of continuous integration. It should apply to your databases. Uh, there's tools like DB Deploy uh, for doing this. Active record migrations are a similar thing. Another thing you can do, and that a lot of people do who do continuous deployment, is they make their application compatible with multiple database versions. And they make them backwards compatible with the old version, forward compatible with the new version. You can use the same technique for service dependencies as well. Uh, so in AWS, if you look at the AWS URIs, you see there's a date in them. So you can still use the old service when they push out the new version of the service. So that way you decouple teams from each other, um, which is a question that people ask in large organizations. How do you prevent this thing where everyone has to synchronize uh, before we do a push? Well, you decouple them by decoupling the technology stack. So I'm kind of out of time now, so I just want to conclude with a couple of thoughts. People are really the most important thing. Everyone involved in delivery, operations, testers, developers, um, the business, 
uh, finance uh, needs to get together at the beginning of every project or product and keep meeting all the way through, uh, whether that's through retrospectives, um, through um, showcases, uh, th those are the most, uh, yeah, everyone should come to those things. Everyone should be able to see what's happening. Those charts which show you revenue, which show you bills, should be available to the whole system. Um, at the, I think it's the BMW factory somewhere in Germany, I'm not exactly sure. They, they built this factory where the production line goes through the whole building and they have these glass walls through the cafeteria. So if the production line stops, everyone can see, whether it's the CEO, people sitting in the, the restaurant or people working. Everyone should be able to see what's going on. And then crucially, you're never done with making your process better. You should apply the scientific process to improving your organization. You have a hypothesis, you test it, you see the results, you learn. Plan, do, check, act. Another W. Edwards Deming um, thought. Uh, and that's really all I have. So do we have time for some questions? Oh, thank you. qui nous reste 5 minutes pour les questions. Ah, qui a des questions du coup Ah bah si. So when you do all the testing at the end or in the middle, how do you test across all the browsers if you have a website um. So the question, when you do the testing at the end, or not. or not, when you don't do the testing at the end, yeah, every time you check in. So what we do on our product is we just have a bunch of boxes. Um, so we have a box with, we have a, like a Linux box with Firefox, a Linux box with Chrome, um, a Windows box with IE, God forbid. Uh, so you have all these boxes and you just run your tests in parallel on all those boxes. So every time a check-in passes the unit tests, that triggers automated tests, and those run simultaneously on all those different boxes. And you can see, we, we, in, in Go, the product we built, there's a way of seeing which tests failed on which boxes, so you can see at a glance which platforms are problematic with which tests. But yeah, you, uh, parallelization is a key element of this. Those are only ever gonna be representative. One of the problems, I mean, with software as a service, it's not so bad. With user installed software, it's really bad, because you can't test on everyone's laptop. Um, but you have a representative sample. And you can gather metrics to see if your sample really, really is representative. Hi, Mr. Hamo. I'd like to know about this meeting uh, you were talking about uh, to gather all the, the people from different uh, departments. Uh, can you imagine something uh, like the the ITIL uh, change management meeting? Yes, so ITIL is, uh, ITIL is interesting because ITIL, um, the, the principle of ITIL is to make IT a, strate a strategic resource for the business. That's the stated aim of ITIL. And ITIL has a lot of good stuff in it. If you're in a chaotic system with no process, ITIL is great. But lots of implementations of ITIL rely on putting these processes in place that are very waterfall. You can do ITIL in an agile way. There's a book called The Visible Ops Handbook which talks about this. Change management, if you look in ITIL, there's three kinds of changes. Emergency changes, standard changes, and normal changes. Um, so standard changes are pre-approved. They don't require sign-off from the uh, ch uh, change advisory board, the CAB. So one of the things that continuous delivery is about is understanding the risk of each change. If you have a good continuous deployment pipeline, you can see for each change what the risk is of putting that change out. And then you can say, well, if it's low risk and we understand the risk, then it's a standard change. We don't need approval. ITIL v3 talks about having electronic CAD meetings so that you don't actually have to have everyone in a room, um, although it's important to have everyone in a room regularly anyway for doing retrospectives at least uh, and looking at the data and looking at how you make the process better. Um, but you don't need to have you know, weekly CAD meetings in a room and wait a week before your change gets approved. Um, one of my colleagues worked in a large manufacturing organization where they had a spreadsheet with seven tabs. 
for change management. And the developers filled it in. The person approving it was in a different continent. They read it. They didn't understand it. The developers knew they didn't understand it. They knew the developers knew they didn't understand it. And so the developers filled it full of crap. And they knew it was filled full of crap. And they approved it anyway because they knew that the developers would probably not do anything stupid. At that point, it's not a risk management process. It's a blame management process. So the point is, with ITIL, you can do ITIL in an agile way. Part of the point of continuous deployment is, is to actually give you a better grasp of the risk of your changes, which is totally in tune with ITIL. On a le temps de prendre une dernière question. Hi. When you're doing uh, canary testing or canary releasing, um, how, do you, how do you select the population that will test the, the new feature? Is there, are there good customers or bad customers? Or? Yes, yeah, that's an excellent question. You're absolutely right. Um, what a lot of people do, uh, or, well, I, should, I shouldn't exaggerate. One case study I've heard of is where um, they actually have uh, power users. And they know who the power users are through their monitoring. And it's the power users who get to see the new features. In the Facebook video, they have a tool called Gatekeeper. And they can actually select which groups of users see which features. So they can say, for this feature, only people inside Facebook can see it. Or only people in the US. Or only people who uh, don't use Slashdot. Or they have all kinds of different ways of cutting up users. And they can control which, users, which groups of users see which features. So that should be something that you can control. Sure, absolutely. It, it should be possible for, again, you get your stakeholders together. John talked about before putting every feature live, you have a go, no, go meeting. What you might do is you know, have, have a meeting to decide with how you're going to incrementally roll that feature out. Well, we're, 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 we're OK. When we release this feature, we're going to deploy it first to this users. These are the things we're going to measure. And then based on that, we'll work out who to release it next, or if we're going to make some changes. All that should be in the hands of the business. Um, they should have, you know, engineering shouldn't even have to touch anything in order for the business to be able to make those decisions and, and self-service them. You're welcome. <laughs>